stroke has the same concept as acute coronary syndromes. This is the same artery that is diseased. So instead of the coronary arteries, now this is this is these are now the carotid and the cerebral arteries. Risk factors are the same. I won't repeat it. It's the same atherosclerotic plaque. Um, as far as ischemic stroke is concerned, so it'll be atherosclerosis, which will be your main risk factor. And the risk factors for atherosclerosis are already mentioned in the uh, good coronary syndrome chapter. So I won't repeat that. So same uh, metabolic syndrome, obesity, smoking, hypertension, etc. And there were modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, right? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, stroke is a debilitating condition. We have, it's a big problem, it's top three conditions all over the world. It affects all ethnicities, higher though in African-Americans, as well as the um, Caucasian. Okay, there are two major categories. We have ischemic and we have hemorrhagic stroke. So majority is ischemic, so it's about 9%, I mean 90%. Let's look at first the uh, comparison. Ischemic stroke can either be embolic or thrombotic stroke. Causes or underlying risk factors for ischemic stroke are clotting, okay, thrombosis, so that would be thrombotic stroke. So if you get a thrombotic stroke, that means you have severe atherosclerosis in one or both carotid arteries or any one of your cerebral arteries. We also have embolic stroke. Most embolic strokes are cardiogenic in nature. That means the clot, because when we say thrombotic stroke, where did the clot form? In the carotid or the cerebral arteries. When we say embolic, because it's a traveling clot, right? So it usually comes from the heart. That means the patient's risk factor is either atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or severe valvular disease, for instance, anything that will cause blood to pool inside the heart chambers. And of course, once a clot forms there, then it can travel up to your carotids and end up in your brain. Manifestations, these are the triggers. Now, most people with especially thrombotic stroke, they may suffer a TIA, which is like a mini stroke. It's a transient ischemic attack. We'll talk about it shortly. The other type of stroke is hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic stroke has one of three causes. One is bleeding inside the brain. Now, how would this happen? How did the patients <laughs> suffer a brain bleed? Could be one of the three. One is the patient has a cerebral aneurysm. What are aneurysms? These are weakened arteries. Okay, so the walls of the arteries are weakened. There are three layers of the artery, yeah? We have the endothelial, we have the intima, and then we have the uh, external. The first two layers, the endothelial and the intima, which is the muscle layer of the artery, are weakened. Be uh, why did they weaken? Because of uncontrolled hypertension. So that's the underlying cause. Hypertension weakens the artery. And the patient, of course, has atherosclerosis. Otherwise, the endothelium would not have weakened. Okay, and then over time, that <clears throat> the aneurysm will eventually rupture. Once it ruptures, there's bleeding inside the brain. Another is ABM. ABM are usually congenital. These are, uh, the name tells you what it is, arteriovenous malformation. Now, is an artery normally connected to a vein? Are they connected? No, they can't be connected. So an artery, for example, become, becomes smaller and smaller, correct? As it reaches the periphery. As it reaches its target organ, it becomes an arterial and then becomes a capillary, correct? 
becomes an arterial capillary. And then from there, from that arterial end, it <laughs> joins a venous capillary. Yeah? So now you have a capillary network. Same, same yeah. thing as in your alveoli. So remember the uh, anatomy of your, of your 100 million alveoli. So each one of those microscopic air sacs are wrapped in a capillary network. So there's a capillary, capillary uh, arterial capillary, and there's a venous capillary, a cali allowing gas exchange, yeah? So that's the structure of your arterial and your venous system. An artery cannot be connected to a vein. It should be buffered by a capillary network. And then they become connected at the capillary level. Here, this is a congenital malformation, meaning sometime in your embryonic development, or maybe you were a fetus already, or maybe shortly after birth, you develop these malformations. Over time, I mean, you grow up normal, you know, with no symptoms at all, even if you have multiple AVMs. They become a problem when you grow old because now what, what problems do you develop when you grow old? Hypertension, and then once you expose these malformations to hypertension, you, you see how a fistula, you remember we talked about hemodialysis, uh, baby fistulas last semester? You've seen one in, in person, yeah? Why do they grow big? Because you connected an artery to a vein, right? So same exact result here. So this one is a naturally occurring fistula. Okay? Unlike the AB fistula we, the doctor made where he surgically created it, this one is created by nature. Okay? This was created in the absence of a capillary. So of course, when you expose this to high blood pressure, this will grow and then eventually rupture as well. So same effect as an aneurysm. So they will rupture and then bleed. The third cause of hemorrhagic stroke is uncontrolled hypertension. Whenever you have a severe acute hypertensive episode that could be triggered by let's say severe emotional stress, you got so angry or you got so happy, or let's say you uh, you're new to cocaine for instance, you didn't know how to use it, Instead of us really putting a really skinny line, your line was too thick. Okay, and then when you sniffed it, it caused sudden increase in your blood pressure, rupturing one or more arteries. All right, and in hemorrhagic stroke, this because the rupture was sudden, so the, the onset of symptoms is also acute. Patient usually complains of the worst headache of my life. And then the decreased level of consciousness here and the seizure is because of increased intracranial pressure. We will discuss the physiology of that a little later. And so these are your types of stroke. Let's discuss ischemic stroke first. <laughs> Old names are brain attack. Now we call it a stroke. can also be called a uh, cerebrovascular infarction, okay? Uh, uh, you know, and just like a heart attack, so this was a, this is a brain attack, okay? So brain cells will die here. So we discussed <laughs> earlier in lab that the treatment for ischemic stroke is out of place, and the treatment window is three hours from the onset. Uh, again, we can expand it to four and a half hours according to the American Stroke Association. Arrhythmias are usually the cause of embolic stroke, <laughs> AFib, a flutter, and I mentioned valvular disease or other severe heart diseases resulting in decreased cardiac output. So here is your pathophysiology. So the patient has ischemia because of the clot obstructing the blood flow. And of course, that will cause ischemia, then eventually necrosis, and then an infarction. Manifestations. <clears throat> For the lay people, we have signs of this all over the hospital. The acronym is BEFAST, B-E-F-A-S-A-T. 
uh, B stands for balance or, or um, you know, balance or walking gait problems. And then E will be eye or vision changes. Now the eye or vision changes will be unique to each person. Some of them will have blindness in one or both eyes, for instance, we call that hemianopsia. It could be blurring of vision, it could be total blindness. Okay. Um, then F would be facial drooping. A would be asymmetric um, uh, arms. Okay. Arms will be uh, weakened or paralyzed. Then S would be a slurred speech. And then T is time to call 911. But the symptoms extend beyond the BFAS though. We, we teach BFAS to lay people to educate them about the general manifestations of a stroke, but realize that as a clinician, there are other signs of a stroke. Okay, so it's not just BFAS. The following on page 2033 are the other manifestations. They also include symptoms of BFAS, but uh, take note that confusion or change in mental status can also be signs of a stroke. Then we have the, besides the weakness of the arm, there will also be numbness, okay? uh, especially it's usually asymmetrical, you know, meaning one side of the body only, left or right. Or as mentioned earlier, sudden severe headache, especially in the uh, hemorrhagic stroke, but it can also be a manifestation in ischemic stroke. We look at the table for the complete list earlier. So some of the motor loss are the following. So if it's weakness, then it's hemiplegia. If it's paralysis, then it is hemi, I uh, know, sorry. Hemiplegia is paralysis and then paresis, hemiparesis will be weakness. Now, it's always on one side because let's say the patient has a right-sided stroke, then the manifestations will be on the left side because cranial nerves cross. <laughs> There's communication loss. Now, let's differentiate the following uh, medical terms. Dysarthria is difficulty speaking. The patient speech is slurred. But this is because of a motor problem. Paralysis of the mo muscles responsible for speech, meaning the patient's ability to form and express ideas and language is intact. Does that make sense? Meaning the only problem is a motor problem, meaning they're capable of written, written speech. They just cannot articulate it well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's dysarthria. Aphasia, however, it's much more serious because this one, aphasia, is the brain's ability to actually form an idea and understand other people's expressions. Okay? So aphasia can, it's usually both. The patient has expressive and receptive aphasia. Some people may just have one or the other. Expressive aphasia, they're unable to express either written or spoken uh, language. And receptive would be inability to understand written or spoken language. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's a difference between the two. Okay, this arthria, these people can communicate in other means. Does that does that make sense? Okay, so this arthria, they can they can write. Okay, so for example, um, I know um, we had an electrician before. He repairs our, all our appliances. I was a small kid. We always call him uh, when the TV breaks down. Uh, and he, he had a stroke. He suffered a stroke and he had dysarthria. More on top of the dysarthria, he also lost um, the ability to move his tongue. So all the while, he, he, uh, he has drooling problems, okay? So he would have a towel or across his neck okay, just, just to catch drool, okay? And he can't speak very clearly, so he writes. When, when he talks to us, you know, like he, may, he, may, he needs parts, for instance, he gives us the code for the repair, okay? So he, he writes it down, right? So that's this art there. Does that make sense? Okay. Whereas aphasia, do you think aphasia, a basic people can still go to work? 
almost impossible. Okay? Very difficult to express ideas, so they cannot function basically. Okay? So they're, they're disabled. Apraxia is inability to perform a previously learned action. So the patient will have verbal substitutions for desired words or syllables. Okay? So meaning they 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 it's it's a it's a command. Okay, so to to elicit apraxia, you ask them to do uh, something that uh, they normally would know what to do. For instance, uh, do you know how to do the hokey pokey? Probably not all cultures know hokey pokey, but you know how to sing happy birthday, yeah? Okay, so they won't be able to do that. Okay, that's apraxia. So it's a command. Okay. Perceptual disturbances, so these are usually vision changes. I mentioned earlier that there are there's partial blindness in uh, there's different types. So, so there's homonymous hemianopsia, meaning if it's homonymous, each eye is blind on one side. Meaning if I have homonymous hemianopsia, if it's the right side, hem homonymous hemianopsia, meaning each of my eye is blind in the right side of the visual field. So that means I have blind spots. I can see, for instance, if I'm facing this way, I can see Tanisha. I cannot see Christina. Okay, but when I move my head this way, ah, oh, there's Christina. Okay, meaning I have blind spots. Okay, because each eye is half blind, but they're both blind on the same side, either left side or right side of each visual field. Now, it can also be heterogeneous uh, blind hemianopsia, meaning it could be the um, right side of, of my left eye, and then it's the left side of my right eye. So that means I cannot see in front of me, but I can see peripherally. Okay, so these are the weird uh, visual changes, depending really on where is the stroke and what side of my head was affected in which side of my brain uh, tissues died. So if they, if they affect that particular visual, visual function, then that would be the resulting uh, visual deficit. I also have sensory loss. Could be from tactile, could be visual, auditory. Uh, agnosia is, there's different types of agnosia. Agnosia is inability to recognize something, an object. For instance, um, if I have tactile agnosia, I will hold this phone and not know what to do with it. I could also see something, let's say food. Okay, so uh, visual agnosia um, would be for, let's say, we, we see this also on uh, severe or advanced dementia. When uh, people are given a tray of food, they look at it, they see it, but they don't know what it is. So how will they know what to do with it? They don't know what it is. Okay? So that's why people with stage 4 dementia usually die because they stop eating. Because they don't know what to do with that food. Okay? So that's why these people, unless they have a, an advanced directive, they'll be given a pipe tube. Okay? They'll be given feeding tube just to, just for nutrition because they don't know how to eat, okay? So same thing also in, in stroke. So if these patients develop this type of agnosia, then yes, they'll have uh, a feeling too, okay? Yes. So um, agnosia would be like... Yeah, they can recognize, recognize objects. In apraxia, can't It's a command, yeah. It's motor. And yeah, there are also emotional um, changes, depending again which side of the brain was uh, suffered the stroke or the infarction. Patient will have forgetfulness or they'll have emotional lability. Okay? They'll have sudden outbursts of emotion. One moment they're happy, next day, next moment they're, they're violent okay? or they're sad or they're <coughs> extremely happy. Okay? And the sad thing about this is they cannot control these emotions. I repeat, they cannot control it. So therefore, how do you deal with it? Can you handle it with therapeutic communication? 
no, that will not work. That will further frustrate the patient because in the first place, they don't understand why they're having these emotions. They don't understand. Why am I behaving like this? Can, can that be embarrassing in public? Yes, in a social environment, that's extremely embarrassing. Okay, and then the patient's aware of, of what you know what they're doing, but they have no control over it. Though. Okay, they cannot control. Oh, I, I have to, you know, I'm acting like crazy. Okay, but they cannot control it. Is that understood? Mm -hmm. So here's a summary of your deficits. So from homonymous hemianopsia. Now on the exam, I will ask you, of course, how to handle it, right? If the patient has these different deficits, so questions would be, how do you manage it? How can you help the patient? So the interventions will be on the third column. The manifestation, of course, on the second column helps you helps you understand what they're feeling, okay? How, how they're um, how they're behaving or what's causing it, and then the third column, of course, is your interventions. All right, I won't read it for you. Are you responsible? They're self-explanatory. Uh, ataxia is a gait problem. You know, they have problems walking, uh, usually from weakness or paralysis of one side. So we, we need the help of physical and occupational therapy for these. Uh, dysphagia. Each patient who suffers a stroke, by the way, for the first 24 hours, you do not feed them. So automatically, they're NPO, and we will consult a speech-language pathologist, an SLP, to evaluate the patient. And then if they pass the swallow test, then the SLP will prescribe a diet, and that will be approved by the physician. Otherwise, if the <clears throat> SLP determines, oh, this patient cannot swallow safely, then the patient will probably have a feeding tube, depending on the patient's <laughs> wishes. Okay, so it's, again, I um, emphasize we all we all should have an advanced directive, okay, to prepare for moments like this. And have a conversation. Okay, it's it's easier to make that conversation now that we're we're well, you know, we're 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 healthy, because it's much more difficult when the time comes. Okay. I definitely have questions on how to communicate with patients with aphasia, okay? Uh, please remember they are, uh, especially what, if it's art, dysarthria, because dysarthria, remember their cognition is intact, okay? They just cannot, they just cannot speak, okay? Because of a, a motor paralysis, okay? The motor, the, you know, the muscles involving speech. So they're not stupid, okay? So establish appropriate communication. Uh, with uh, aphasia, they, you'll notice this, that the patient is, they'll converse with you, but some words that they use don't make any sense. And that, again, frustrates the patient because that's not what they intended to say, but comes out different. Okay? So they, that's not the idea they wanted to, to, to convey to you, but then that's what, what came out, right? Like they'll substitute, remember there was uh, mentioned earlier on the statement, <laughs> they'll end up substituting some words, okay? So because, uh, again, th there's a problem with forming the idea or with if it's receptive, then the problem with understanding, okay? So you understand why it's difficult to stay employed uh, if you have aphasia. And most, again, have global, which is mixed. They have both receptive and expressive aphasia. So long story short, don't get a stroke, okay? I won't test you on table 62-3, so we'll just keep with the previous uh, table, table 62-1. Okay, let's talk about a TIA. A TIA is a mini stroke. It's not really a stroke. Um, let's call it a... Um, Remember chronic stable angina or angina pectoris? So what happened in angina pectoris? Was there ischemia? 
Yes, that's why it caused chest pain. Yeah? So was the uh, reduced blood flow to the myocardium permanent or short term? Short term, right? It was preceded by something. Yeah, uh, it's a, an, an event that increased heart rate. Yeah, meaning there was an imbalance between oxygen to supply and demand. Same exact thing here. Mm -hmm. Although this will not result in chest pain because are there nerve endings, sensory nerves in the brain? No, even if I poke your brain, like this, I take out your skull and I poke your brain, you won't feel anything, right? So therefore, the patient, yes, there was an interruption of blood flow, but momentary, momentary interruption of blood flow. However, at that moment, the patient looks like they have a, they're having a stroke, okay? But the symptoms resolve in, within 24 hours on its own. Whether we gave them something or not, it resolves. Of course, it will resolve faster if we give them aspirin or clavic, for instance. A, that will resolve it faster. But uh, it can resolve on its own if it's a TIA. So is it really a stroke? No. no, because no brain cells died as a result. A, but there was interruption in the blood flow. So for a moment, it looked like the patient was having a stroke. Is this good or bad? Good and bad. Good and bad, because good because it wasn't a stroke, but it's also bad because yes, the patient was lucky. Okay, the patient was lucky. It wasn't a stroke, but you 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 nevertheless manifested manifestations of stroke. So therefore, aggressive education. Okay, on the patient, we treat the patient. We we exact we diagnose the patient. What are the risk factors? Okay, which which arteries are blocked? Is it, is it the carotid? Is it the the um cerebral arteries? Okay, and then we we fix it because we don't want them having an actual stroke in the future. Okay, so consider a TIA <coughs> uh, a warning. Okay, and then uh, you know uh, you you were given a second chance. Okay, hey. That was a warning. Okay. Next one, next time may not be a TIA anymore. Okay, you may not be as lucky. So we still treat a TIA. Okay, we treat it just like um, you know with uh, ACS. So what do we put the patient on? We put them on statins. Yeah, we give them statins. We give them aspirin, Plavix. Okay, just like ACS. And then do we uh, have them stop smoking? Okay, lose weight, stay active, eat better. Okay, it's all those good things, right? Because again, we don't want them to have an actual <laughs> stroke. As mentioned during the lab, the initial diagnosis, so once we have stroke symptoms, we don't know if it's a TAA or stroke yet. So we will take the patient to the CAT scan immediately. Within 10 minutes of arrival, take them to the CAT scan. A non-contrast CAT scan is okay. We'll take a scan. And then if the radiologist recommends, oh, it's not in, it's not conclusive, okay? So let's say they say, okay, on this scan, no infarction, okay? But then sometimes they, they see something else and then they recommend an MRI. So yeah, MRI would be recommended, okay, to, to, to have more detail, okay? And then they'll do the uh, recommendations of the radiologist. But if not, if it's, it was clear on a non-contrast, no, oh, definitely... Okay, no stroke, then that's it. So our, our next intervention depends on the CAT scan result. So if it's a stroke, then we'll proceed with thrombolytic therapy if, uh, if, you know, if, if it, the patient meets it. Uh, sometimes, um, I should say really often, more often because as I said earlier in lab, most of these people are... Who are these people who suffer a TIA or a stroke? Oh. Elderly. So 65, usually retired, yeah? So they're at home, <laughs> they're home all day, or maybe they're out in the park, for instance, usually alone, or even if they were with somebody, if that somebody is not educated, meaning we do not provide community education, okay? So our community leaders don't have those, our council members don't have funding for that, you know, no... Um, no um, town hall educations, you know, no, um, uh, what else do we have in, out in the community? We have, you know, tables, tents, you know, we, we um, healthcare, um, healthcare uh, screenings, okay, yeah, that free for the community. They make people aware of, of stroke. 
Okay, so if we don't have those, then people are uneducated about stroke. Okay, so because of course, if you, if this is not your field, lucky for us, we're in the healthcare field. But what if you're a computer programmer or let's say, you know, a business person? Okay, so you you don't you're not really aware. Or if you let's say you're a lawyer, my wife's a lawyer, knows nothing about these things. Okay, so um, so it's important that people get educated. Because what are you supposed to do on retirement? You're supposed to enjoy it, right? Yeah, yeah. not lay in bed with your with your face, um, <laughs> you know, drooling toward one side, right? That's not that's no way to spend your retirement. Do you want to retire like that? Oh, you're supposed to enjoy, right? Travel, buy a boat, okay, buy an RV, yeah, enjoy your your hard work. So let's start with prevention first. Of course, we know the underlying risk factors. So smoking, obesity, metabolic syndrome. So I won't repeat it. We, we did this in acute coronary syndrome. So same prevention. Here are your risk factors again, 62-1. This is identical to the risk factors for acute coronary syndromes. So besides thrombolytic therapy, there are endovascular interventions. So let's say the patient missed the three to four and a half hour window. Yeah, meaning they waited too 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 late. The okay? patient was six hours already, or let's say it's been two days or one week since the onset of symptoms. What? There's nothing we can do. Okay, the, the that part of the brain is already infarcted. It's dead. Okay? we can't bring them back to life. So these deficits will be permanent. We could have reversed them if they came within three to four and a half hours, but outside that window, there's nothing we can do for you. But we can still prevent a future stroke though, okay? So we can we can do for the future. Nothing we can do with your current deficits. So other treatments would be, let's say we missed the window, yeah? So we'll do testing. Don't worry, we'll do testing. We'll, we'll evaluate your risk for another one. So we'll look at your neck, it will do an ultrasound of your neck. Look at the carotids. Are they blocked? And if they are blocked, over 80% blocked, <laughs> we'll clean it out. Right? We'll, we'll open it. So that's called CEA. So uh, and, uh, carotid endarterectomy. This can also be used in any other artery, in any other large artery. Okay? So they'll clean it out. There's a picture somewhere here. Uh, just note, though, that if you undergo this procedure, there is a likelihood that you'll have a stroke after the or during the procedure. Okay, it's possible. Okay, here's the acute intervention. We discussed this earlier. So just like the heart attack, will these patients receive uh, heparin? Yes, heparin infusion as well because can they have another blood clot? Mm -hmm. Yes, remember stroke, ischemic strokes are caused by blood clot. So just like the heart attack, we don't want any further strokes. Um, so we'll put them on a heparin um, and then of course the uh, thrombolytic if if necessary. Okay, if, if they're in the window, we give them the thrombolytic first and then 24 hours after we'll start heparin or aspirin. So just like ACS, we give them aspirin and Flavix. Again, this is uh, during the acute episode. So we give them uh, not one aspirin, but if uh, they receive the um, thrombolytic first, then we won't give the aspirin until 24 hours later, okay, if that's the case, because we don't want to increase the risk of bleeding. Statins will be recommended. And then evaluate the patient for rehab. We'll discuss the eight um, core measures for stroke because that is testable on the NTLEX, meaning for every stroke patient, ischemic stroke patient admitted in the hospital, the hospital must make sure these eight <coughs> measures are done during that hospitalization. Okay, but we'll get to that shortly. So here's thrombolytic therapy. We discussed this in lab. So the dose again is... 
0.9 milligrams per kilogram. So how is it given again? 10% over 10% over one minute, then the remaining 90 over one half. When is the onset? Uh, when when is the time of three and a half to four and a half hours counted? Since from when do we count that? Upon arrival, arrival to the upon arrival to the medical facility. When do we count the three hours from the onset of symptoms? The problem again, the challenging part is if it was not witnessed. Okay, so if it's not witnessed, then we, of course, try to get information. So let's say uh, it happened actually here. We have an, we had an instructor who was uh, suffering a stroke. So it was Professor Tolentino who found her. So it was around break time. So the class started at 9, right? And the break was around 10.30. So um, Professor Tolentino saw the instructor, a uh, couple seats, beside her so she was you no know, she said you know hi okay enjoy class and then so she went to class and then when she came back at 10 30 she was like this okay slumped in chair unresponsive so you no know, stroke symptoms right so we gather what time was that so it must have been around nine yeah mm -hmm. so sometime be between nine and 10 30 so is she in the window Yes, that's about 90 minutes. So she's well inside the three to four and a half hour window. So what we did, uh, what Professor Tonitino did was call 911. And because we're close to New York Presbyterian, what you know what they sent? Uh, because of the stroke symptoms, they sent an ambulance that has a CAT scan oh, in wow. it. They have one. Okay? No, really. So it's a you know a, a smaller CAT scan. They they managed to fit it into the ambulance. So in transit, because I mean you see uh, wherever you go, I mean there's traffic, right? Nobody respects the. We don't have a um, fire lane or something, right? So uh, ambulance did its best, but we had the diagnosis right in the ambulance, and because we have internet. So Wi-Fi trans transmitted the result of the CAT scan. Doctor got the result, interpreted it. It's ischemic stroke. Administer out the place right away. And they were paramedics, not EMT. Okay, so they sent paramedics. So paramedics can give out the place. So they started the out place right there. So when she reached the hospital, yeah, the the not done yet. No, I guess it takes an hour. Yeah, but it was already infusing. So it reversed her symptoms for so we were able to save a lot of brain tissue so with rehab she's she's fine okay um, she has some you know minor deficits but she's enjoying retirement okay so she's you know she's free to move about you know enjoying enjoying life okay so she stopped teaching not worth it okay so she had a life-changing event she she didn't come back after that so all right yeah but she was one of the lucky ones yeah, so so that's you know that's how important time is, right? So time is tissue, just like in in heart attack, time is muscle. Okay. So I won't repeat the uh, administration. We did that in lab. Okay. So for endovascular therapy, this is again the endarterectomy. So why is this done? So this is done to for two reasons. This can actually be. Of course, this will prevent a future stroke, yeah? So we clean the carotids, for instance. Mm -hmm. They can also actually uh, manage an acute stroke. Okay? So it's both to manage acute stroke as well as prevent future strokes. So these are the criteria to be met. <clears throat> so if the patient meets these criteria, then they can have a vascular intervention, which is the endarterectomy. So paramount importance is really the, the 10 minutes. Okay? We need to get a diagnosis within 10 minutes of arrival at the medical facility. Okay, we discussed the eligibility criteria. Again, for the 
contraindications, please go back to the ACS chapter. That's where it's listed. There was a chart there. If the patient, uh, however, because uh, there's an intra-arterial uh, administration here. So the three to four and a half hours is for IV administration of alteplase, okay? IV administration of the drug. If the patient missed the four and a half hour window, however, they're still within the six hours, there's some doctors will administer alteplase intra-arterially. Again, there's, they miss the three to four and a half hour window, but they're still within six hours. The patient can still be taken to the cath lab. And of course, instead of the coronary um, intervention, we will do a cerebral or carotid intervention. So now the doctor will thread a catheter, just like if they were having a heart attack. But instead of going to the heart, they'll go to the brain. Okay, So they'll inject the outer place straight into the clot. So... They'll locate the clot. Oh, it's right there. Within six hours, we'll give the other place intra-arterially. Okay, we can still save the patient's brain. So they go in and then inject. So not systemic. It's now local. <clears throat> They'll inject it straight into the into the blood clot, dissolving the clot and then restoring uh, blood flow. Okay, so that's an option. But the doctor decides that because, of course, that's a very invasive uh, procedure. So side effects again of, of thrombolytics is massive bleeding. So we need to watch for those signs of bleeding. So we control the blood pressure. We look at the blood pressure in a little bit. So avoid any unnecessary tubes or lines, okay, if, if we can, so that we don't uh, cause increased risk for bleeding. And as already mentioned, not all patients will be candidates for other place. Either they have the contraindications or they miss the window. In which, in that case, again, we all we can do is what? Prevent more strokes, right? So if they're having an acute stroke right now outside the window, we can put them on heparin, right? Heparin, prevent a future clots. And then, again, we look at the risk factors and then decide on the next action based on their risk factors. What do they have? Is it AFib? Yeah. Is that what caused the stroke? Okay. So these patients are always on a cardiac monitor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then the doctor will also see, okay, so it's not, you know, the heart the heart rhythm is normal. So it must be vascular. Right. <clears throat> so the doc the patient will have two doctors on the case, a neurologist and a cardiologist. Why a cardiologist? Because most ischemic strokes are embolic, okay? And then most embolic strokes are caused by cardiogenic problems, all right? Okay, so you have two specialists there. Now, let's examine now the patient who did have a, an infarction, okay? So parts of the brain died. We don't know how extensive, but what will happen to the tissues around that dead area? So you have something dead in your body. So what will happen there? Will there be inflammation and swelling? Yes. So in, whether there's inflammation and swelling, right? Uh, let's examine the skull. So a grown-ass person's skull, is there anything open? Compare it to an infant. Is an infant's skull closed? No, it's not fused yet. We have fontanelles, right? And we have suture lines. There's, they're all open, yeah? So the brain, the brain can expand, the skull can expand. In a grown person, is there anything still open? No. The only open area is the foramen magnum. But even that is occupied by the spinal cord, right? So that's where the spinal cord comes out of your skull. So therefore, if you add any swelling, edema, inflammation, is there room for that? No. Your head is already full. What's in your head? You got brain tissue, we have CSF fluid, and we have blood. Yeah, that's it. Can you put a hammer in there? No, you can't put anything in there. So, but we, we do, we have an increase here. Okay, we have swelling and there's edema. So did intracranial contents increase? Yes, yes it, it, it increased in volume. So therefore, will it increase intracranial pressure? 
Yes. So once these uh, extra matter uh, form inside your skull, then there will be increase in your cranial pressure. All right. So this is the NIH stroke scale, which I said we will not be testing. Okay, this takes time to for you to, uh, and this is only the scoring. The process is uh, another thing you have to master. Okay, what pictures you use? Okay, how do you elicit it? This is just the scoring. Okay, so it's a little complicated. <clears throat> there are thirteen here. I know there's eleven, but there's eleven A, eleven B. Okay, so that's thirteen. These are your interventions for increased ICP. Number one is give oxygen. The reason for the increased oxygen <laughs> is um, once you have increased intracranial pressure and then your brainstem is pushed out of your skull because the nat that's the natural um, result, right? So let's say uh, I give you an example, um, <clears throat> a glass of water. Okay, so imagine a glass of water is your skull. You filled it with water. It's already full. So you have 80% uh, brain tissue, 10% CSF, 10% blood. Yeah, that's what's in your skull. It's already full. Yeah, 80, 10, 10. It's full. If you put one drop there, which is either bleeding, could be swelling, could be inflammation, that means either brain tissue increased, right? Because it, it's, it's edematous. Or let's say CSF volume increase because once you swell the brain, will it compress the, the little canals where CSF is supposed to drain? Yes, you're, you're compressing them. So CSF volume, because you decrease CSF drainage, it will also increase, right? And then you compress blood vessels also as a result of the brain swelling, then you're compressing venous drainage also, yeah? So all of those add up and increases increases volume inside the cranium. So again, we have 80% brain, 10% blood, 10% CSF. Is there room for anything else? Because the total is 100, right? And we increase the brain contents to 110, 120. Is that possible? Yeah. No, that glass, that skull can only contain 100% and it's already full. So if you add anything else, Let's, let's look at, imagine that, let's imagine the glass of water filled to the brim. When you drop another, you add another drop of water there, what will happen? What will happen? It'll overflow. What, what part overflowed? Was it the drop that you added? No. Or something else? Something which is closest to the edge, yeah? Because they will, of course, they will come out uh, following the path of least resistance, yeah? Okay. So this idea, this concept that we're talking about is, is called the Monroe-Kelly Doctrine. The Monroe-Kelly Doctrine says that if volume in one component is increased inside an intact skull, then volume in another component must be displaced, right? Just like that drop. When you put a drop of water there, when the glass is already full, it has to display something, right? Mm -hmm. Someone, something has to go. So that's the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. Okay. So when we follow the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, it only applies if your skull is intact, which is what happens in a stroke. Okay. It's a, di it's a different story if we crack your head open with an axe. Okay. So the Monroe Kelly Doctrine will not apply because your skull is open. Okay. But in stroke. Or a close head injury, for instance, where the skull is closed, then if volume, what did it say again? If volume in one component increases, then volume in another component must be displaced. That's that's common sense, yeah. Okay. So because the the only thing open, so just like that glass of water, did the water that was in the bottom of the glass spill out, or was it the volume closer to the edge of the glass, the ones closest to the edge, to the edge of the glass. So same thing, since our skull, the opening is the form and magnum, and what's the brain part of the brain that's closest to it? The brain stem, okay, it's right, right at the opening. So therefore, what will come out? 
the brain stem will be pushed out. Now, what are the functions of your brain stem? All the vital functions we need to live. Heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, they're all le level center of consciousness, okay? Because the reticular activating system is there. So your site of consciousness is there too. So if it's pushed out, what will happen to your respiratory rate? It will drop. So what happens to your oxygen level? What will happen to your CO2 level? It will increase. And we know CO2 is a potent vasodilator, meaning it will cause vasodilation if you have a high CO2. So if we have a patient who's having a brain herniation and the respiratory rate drops, CO2 levels rise, what will happen to blood volume in the brain? You dilated the blood vessels in the brain. So what happens to blood volume? Okay, my blood vessel in the brain is supposed to be this cord right here. When they dilated, they're now this big. So what happened to blood volume? It increases blood volume. So what happens to intracranial pressure? It will increase. So how can I stop it? I'll give oxygen. Okay, so if I give oxygen, what happens to the CO2? It will drop back to normal. What happens to ICP? It goes back to normal. Okay, next, head of the bed elevation, 30 degrees. So this is, some books say up to 45, but um, best elevation would be 30 degrees. Why? If you elevate the head any higher than 45 degrees, let's say 60, 90, what happens to hip flexion? My hip, the angle of my hip, what happens? If I'm now here like this, so this is now, 90 degrees, right? So what happened to my hip flexion? Acute, yeah? Whereas if I'm 30, it'll be more like this, yeah? So what happens to my intra-abdominal pressure if I'm at 90? Because now my abdominal contents are pushing against the diaphragm, pushing against my lungs. So therefore, what will happen to intra-abdominal pressure? It increases, right? And then if my abdominal contents are now pushing against my diaphragm, what happens to my lung expansion? Okay. You won't be able to so therefore, will my lungs intrathoracic pressure also rise? Okay, so my left and right lung pressures increase. What will they do to my poor heart, which is in the middle? They will compress my heart as well. So now let's look at venous drainage from your head. Blood that's supposed to return to the heart via the sphere of Vinakava. Can that drainage be free-flowing? No. So what happens to ICP? Increases. Okay. So we so far we've explained oxygenation and its effect on ICP. Next, positioning of the of the head of the bed. Okay. Because again, we're concerned about hip angle flexion. And then uh, another is for patients who really have sky high ICP, we have to do hemicraniectomy. So this is to, we'll open your skull. Okay, we'll open your skull and then take out a piece of your skull. Okay, and then we'll we'll keep that somewhere. We'll put that piece of skull in your in your abdominal wall. Okay, we'll cut a hole here, insert that skull, keep it there. Okay, for for later use. Meanwhile, you have no skull here, but you have a scalp. Your scalp is intact, so we'll stitch your scalp back, but the brain, I mean the skull, is missing a piece. Okay, so that allows for relieving the pressure. Okay, so we, we decrease ICP. Uh, another, of course, if we if we can't remember the, the GCS here, how bad is the GCS at this point? So we're having brain herniation. Pretty low, right? So the GCS score. You know, we practiced GCA score earlier. Okay, so it's probably eight or less. So we'll have to intubate the patient. To protect the airway and also, can we maximize oxygenation if we intubate the patient? Yes, because now we have a ventilator. We also need to monitor 
the uh, not only hemodynamic, but we'll also have to monitor the patient's ICP. Okay, so the doctor will have to drill a hole here, put a catheter into one of the ventricles of the brain to monitor um, intracranial pressure. Uh, again, we we want the patient's uh, blood pressure to be what again? Yeah, at least 140 over 90 to less than 185 over 110. Now, that number can vary depending on the neurologist. Okay, so the neurologist may set it at 20, 220, uh, as high as 220. Okay, um, but that's rare. So uh, sometimes they'll allow it if it's, let's say, 190. Um, they'll give you orders though. Okay, so they'll give you orders. So because sometimes, of course, it is concerning, right? Blood pressure that high. So you report that to the doctor, and they'll they'll tell you, okay, so whether or not to do something. Okay, but you need to report the number. Monitor the patient's neurologic status, and of course, uh, that's another thing that will affect ICP is fever. What is the effect of fever on blood vessels? Dilation or constriction? Heat. What will heat do? Heat. Dilate or constrict? Dilate. Okay. So fever will dilate blood vessels. So therefore, once patient has fever, what happens to ICP? Increases. Headache is a common manifestation of increased ICP. So that's why when you have a fever, do you have a headache? Yes. yes, because the ICP increased. All right, and then our blood pressure, what is this again? We need it to be, systolic must be between 140 to 180, okay? So this is apply, applicable to stroke, head injury, brain trauma. Are we clear? All right, we want our blood pressure to be high. Now to... Um, I'll, I'll come back to this. Let me explain why the blood pressure needs to be high. Please remember 2039, page Okay, cerebral perfusion pressure. What is this? So this is the minimum blood pressure needed in order to perfuse brain tissue. I repeat, CPP is the minimum blood pressure needed in order to perfuse brain tissue, you know, to provide blood flow and oxygen to the brain tissue. The formula for CPP is CPP equals MAP minus ICP. I repeat, the formula for CPP is MAP minus ICP. The normal CPP is 70 to 100 millimeters of mercury. It must be between 70 to 100 millimeters of mercury. So, if the patient's so what is CPP again? What's the formula? So we have C P P equals MAP minus ICP. And we need CPP to be what? 70 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so my blood pressure is 120 over 80. What's the MAP? Two times 
93. Say your ICP, normal ICP is 0 to 15. So after a stroke or head injury, that may rise to 21. What if what is my patient's CPP? Okay. <clears throat> that is if your ICP is only 21. What if it's 24 or 25? Let's make it 25. So what is it now? Is that good or bad? That's bad. Okay, so it's below 70 now. Technically, your, your brain cells are alive at 60 millimeters of mercury CPP. However, below 60, brain cells will start to die. Do you want to be at 60? Do you want to be at 70? Yes, yes I'd rather be at 70 rather than 60 okay but technically again technically speaking at 60 brain cells are perfusing but one slight change it will start killing brain cells brain cells start to die so again do you want to be right at 60 or 70 or better i want to be at 70. so what do you want this blood pressure to be 120 over 80 or 140 over 90. I want it as high as possible because the higher my blood pressure, the better my CPP will be. Do you understand? So does this make sense now? Why the blood pressure needs to be to stay elevated? Yes, because we know, uh, let's go back to the textbook. We had interventions, yeah? 2039, we had our, we had our, Interventions there for increased ICP, yeah? Okay. You think with these interventions, it's easy to drop ICP? You know, knowing that it's an intact skull, is it easy to drop ICP? Not that easy, okay? It's, so it's which one's easier to manipulate, the ICP or the blood pressure? The blood pressure is easier, easier to manipulate. Okay? We have limited. These are the only interventions we have. And there's only one drug we can give, which is mannitol, which we man mentioned later. Okay? Mannitol is an osmotic diuretic. The problem with osmotic diuretic is it is a diuretic. It will decrease brain inflammation, brain swelling, sorry. It will decrease brain edema by pulling water from the, from the brain. However, what will is it also lower? Since it's a diuretic, it will also lower blood pressure. That's the problem. Okay, so it, again, it's not easy to decrease ICP because the swelling, of course, when something is injured, let's say you had a stroke, something died, will the inflammation go down immediately? No, it will take its time, yeah? So, so the body will heal in its own time. Until then, ICP remains high. So can you drop ICP right away? No. no. So what can you do in the meantime? We'll have to raise the blood pressure. So if you expect the brain to stay alive, you have to raise the blood pressure and keep it high. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is the only exception. Okay. All others, no, of course we want the blood pressure to be normal. Okay. So sometimes if the patient has cardiac uh, problems, sometimes they'll have a, a problem because remember, there's a neurologist who has different goals. Okay. So if a patient has cardiac problems as well as having a stroke, we could have a little uh, disagreement there because what do you think the, the cardiologist wants for the blood pressure? They want it low. What is the ne neurologist want? I. Right, so sometimes you'll see uh, orders there that the the, um, the cardiologist will uh, administer will order you know a beta blocker 
then the cardiologist comes in and then discontinues that order. Okay. Okay. And then, you know, cardiologist comes back, writes it again. Okay. So you just, you know, you're in the middle, right? What do you want me to do? Okay. <laughs> In that case, what do you do? They'll figure it out. Okay. But you see, you know, sometimes you, you'll see that because there's competing um, priorities. Okay. So the cardiologist is concerned about heart function, but we're also concerned about brain function. Mm -hmm. Complications. You remember diabetes <laughs> insipidus and um, SIADH? Okay. What were the causes listed last semester? Stroke, brain injury, brain trauma. So can these patients develop SIADH or diabetes insipidus? And will it affect blood volume? Yes. I mean fluid volume? Yes. yes. Will it affect blood pressure? Yes. yes. So that can complicate things, okay, obviously. So watch for those signs. I won't repeat the signs of DI and SIADH. Okay, you're supposed to have learned that already. Um. For patients, blood per, I mean, diabetic, or even if they're not diabetic, there will be an increase in uh, glucose levels because this is a stressful event. We mentioned surgical prevention of stroke, CEA, again, the endarterectomy, carotid endarterectomy. Here's a picture. Mm. And here are complications uh, after the procedure. So watch for those. And it's not in the table. So it's here in the paragraph. So please read that on your own. Oh, it, it, there is a table. Uh, never mind. So table 62 5 are complications related to uh, and their directory. This will include stroke as well. They could have a, a stroke after the procedure. Okay, to summarize, we're still in the acute phase of stroke. Uh, patient's acute phase will last between one to three days. So how long the patient um, needs to be, how long the patient's blood pressure needs to be high is at least 24 hours. Sometimes the doctor can put it as long as 72 hours. Okay, so one to three days. But um, the doctor will tell you, right? So the neurologist will set the, the expectations. So we call that permissive hypertension, okay? So when we allow blood pressure to remain high, we call that what again? Permissive, permissive hypertension, which is, again, is that necessary? Yes, very necessary to preserve brain brain function, to preserve uh, brain perfusion. Evaluation for speech, okay, of course, is done uh, within 24 hours. So SLP will see the patient, a physical therapist and occupational therapist will see the patient. So manage your blood pressure, uh, examine the patient for bleeding, okay, especially if they received all the place. Uh, positioning. So we already know about um, yeah, 30 degrees. And also uh, patient, Remember, they have the deficits, yeah? We have the sensory and motor deficits. So we have the visual problems. They have the cognitive problems, the motor problems, okay? speech, swallowing problems. So manage all of those. Uh, the patients are at risk for DBT, obviously, because one side is weak or paralyzed, so institute um, DBT precautions. Then prepare the patient for ambulation. PT will have to work with the patient the first time. You do not get the patient out of bed until evaluated by the physical therapist. And after that, the PT will recommend activity. And then the, the, it will be signed off by the doctor. 
<laughs> Rehab will help the patient with an you know, OT or occupational occupational therapy will help them with self care. You know, fine motor uh, skills. You know, addressing uh, things like that to to prepare them for home uh, self care. Okay, right? you know how to get in and out of the shower. You know how to adjust to their new body function okay body limitation mobility limitations because now it's either weak or paralyzed they'll tell them how to dress themselves okay now what's what's the best way to put on a shirt or um, pants for instance okay um, they'll also work with a patient on feeding okay how to if they do have a diet now how do they feed themselves okay so they'll recommend also adaptive utensils you know plates we have plate guards we have uh, mugs that have different, um, right? Yeah. So those are you know a little expensive, but you know they should be covered by insurance. Okay. So so they're adaptive um, utensils. Okay. So forks, knives, cups, okay, even plates. So here are the um, recommendations from the OT. <clears throat> so self care. Of course, we want them to have self care to be independent as much as possible. If, however, they Physical therapist recommends inpatient rehab or long-term care placement, then that's what's going to happen. Some patients, especially again, if they miss the three to four and a half hour window, they may end up in a nursing home permanently. So this is a life-changing um, event. Okay, So it's really important that we educate the public we don't want them having strokes. It's unfair, yeah? I mean, they now stop working, stop paying taxes, while the rest of us still pay taxes, okay? So they must be saved, all right? Have to make sure they have no disability, okay? Must restore body function, go back to work, pay their own taxes too, okay? Pay their own share. It's not fair. Yeah. We're the only ones paying taxes. Again, the patients may have to have uh, feeding tubes if if they're if they can't swallow, right? So if it's dangerous to swallow, then they will be recommended by the SLP. There will be some again, depending on which part of the brain is uh, affected, then there will be bowel and bladder problems as a result. Yes. Oh, speech language pathologist or speech therapist. Right. So that's that's their official title, SLP. Improving communication. Remember, there was a table earlier telling you how to communicate with uh, receptive and expressive aphasia and dysarthria. Okay. So this one is more detailed. Okay. So you have. Okay, it's not in a bullet point, it's not in a chart, so it's in a paragraph, right? So just grab it here. And it'll tell you here that you you should use hand gestures, okay, to to get your message across. Okay, that enhances the delivery of your message. Hospitals are very strict with stroke documentation nowadays. Everything must be documented okay, that you did certain things uh, for the patient, especially on stroke education. Because are they at risk for another stroke? Yes. yes. And not only them, but including the family as well. Okay, it should be documented. It's quite extensive. Skin integrity, of course, these people have decreased mobility. So not just pressure ulcers, not just DVTs. Okay. Oh, there is a chart. Okay, so chart 62-4, a little bit easier. So here are your communication techniques with someone with aphasia. Oh, so you know how like, they say um, encourage like, independence? Like, when do you know when to use a communication more than when not to do? Uh, you initiate that on your own. Again, you have to evaluate though. Is the patient having dysarthria or aphasia? Dysarthria, you can give them a communication board. Will it work, will it work with aphasia? Probably not, right? Okay, so these are, if it is aphasia, these are your techniques. Okay, this is how you communicate. 
can use gestures, pictures, objects, okay? whatever, whatever they can uh, will help them communicate. You have to deal with the family as well, especially let's say this patient is the breadwinner. Now what? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now the roles will have to change. Yeah. So it's not easy. Okay. So can you understand there will be some conflicts here? Yeah. And how do will patients express if they're having, you know, imagine it's you. You're the breadwinner. Okay. Now you can't move. Your kids, your wife is now having to carry you, clean doo doo. Okay, so now you're incontinent. They have to, to take care of you now. You were the, the, you know, providing for this family. How does that feel? Yes. Can this, then there'll be conflicts. Can this patient, you know, act out, you know, yeah. just a frustration, you know, powerlessness? Yeah, there'll be conflicts. Okay. Then the wife, you know, may, or the husband, you know, may, may have, you know, there's miscommunication, right? Especially if they don't talk to each other, right? They don't attend support groups. It'll be better if you attend support groups because now you you know how you know other families have coped, okay? And then how they learn to communicate, okay? That you know, yes, this is not your fault. You know that they will help you through it. Sexual dysfunction. Big issue. We have we have younger and younger patients having a stroke now. We have we see thirty five year olds, okay, forty year olds having a stroke. Very sad. Yeah, nowadays we have you know smoking. Okay? It's a lot. It's a, it's, it's a lot. 